Well, if you look at Matthew 23 and verse number 25, we're just looking at one verse in the whole chapter there, okay? Matthew 23, verse 25. Now, if, you have not, if you're not familiar with the Jesus of the Bible, this is a great chapter for you to get familiar with. The fact that he is just criticizing these religious leaders for the entire chapter. You know, most people have this idea of Jesus being this soft, you know, totally humble. He lets himself be kicked around. But actually, there are times when Jesus will stand up. There are certain sins that angered Jesus Christ so much, and he would often go face to face against many of the religious leaders. This is the true Jesus of the Bible. And look at verse number 25. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make the outside of the cup and of the platter uh, sorry, but you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Okay, Within they are full of extortion. The title for the sermon tonight is Full of Extortion. Full of Extortion. In other words, this is another way, another title for this sermon is Sins That Will Get You Kicked Out of Church, Part 6. Okay, now I feel like I've been on this series the whole year. Okay, because I know I started the series early in the year, and then you know I wasn't coming down every week, and then we had the coronavirus thing, and it's still going on, I guess. And you know um, we're trying to work our way through this, but I was trying to show you that in First Corinthians chapter five, in in fact. Please turn there. You can turn away from Matthew 23 now. Please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's remind ourselves uh, that there are certain sins that if you commit as a church member, that you are to be kicked out of the church. Okay? Now, a lot of people think, oh, that's not right. Church is for everybody. No, it's not. There are certain sins that if you're known for this sin, if this is public knowledge within the church, okay, you are to be kicked out because otherwise a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. Okay, it'll corrupt the entire church. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 9. It says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet now, now notice this. He says in verse number 10, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners. So there's that tie, that word extortion there, or with idolaters. For well, then must he needs go out of the world. So what Paul is teaching the church here, he says, look, I've told you not to keep company with the fornicators, but maybe you misunderstood what I was saying the first time. He's saying, look, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, the, the unsaved world. I'm not talking about your, your work colleagues. I'm not talking about the people you come across in your daily life. I'm not talking about people that you come across that are fornicators, covetous, extortioners, or idolaters. Because if you were to avoid everybody in this world that had these sins, it says, for then must you needs go out of the world. He's saying, look, you cannot actually operate in the world if you were to avoid all these people altogether. He says, that's not what I'm talking to you about. He says, look at verse number 11. He says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. A brother, okay? He's, he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church. He says, these are the people that you are to separate from. These are the people that you are to have nothing to do with or kick them out of the church if they're a brother in the church and they're caught up with these sins. He's not talking about the entire world. Otherwise, you need to leave this planet. Okay, because that is the, that is the nature of the uns, you know, unsaved world. But let's keep going there. Uh, is called a brother, be a fornicator, that's number one, or covetous, number two, or an idolater, number three, or a railer, number four, or a drunkard, number five, and now we're up to part six, or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. Okay, don't go and hang out with them. If someone gets kicked out of church, don't go and hang out with them and say, hey, don't worry about it. I, 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 you know, I'll, I'll eat with you, brother. I'll fellowship with you, brother. No, when someone gets kicked out of the church, that's part of the punishment for their sins. That's part of the consequence. And the hope is that they would get this right with God. The hope is they would, get, you know, they would uh, go back to church, you know, ask for forgiveness, and that we will receive them back into the church. We forgive and forget and we move on from that period, okay? But that, this is the way we keep the church cleansed, all right? Now, the word extortion or extortioner is kind of similar to the word railing. You're not going to find it all that often in the Bible. I, I looked this up and I could only find eight references in the whole Bible that have to do with extortion. So what we're going to do for this sermon, it's going to be a bit of a Bible study. We're going to look at all the references. We've already seen some. We saw in Matthew 23 about the Pharisees. We've seen here that if a brother in the church is an extortioner, that you are not to eat with them. Okay? They're not to fellowship with us in the church. 
And so we want to understand what this means. I mean, I'm not sure if in your mind right now you even know what, what extortion is. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But if you can go to the next chapter, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 10. Now, I haven't got time to go through the context of what we're about to read. But if, if you're familiar with this passage, uh, Paul is criticizing the church because they are taking trivial matters of disagreement, trivial matters of problems between brethren to the authorities. Okay, just, uh, you know, there is a time to go to the authorities, okay? The government has been set up to punish evildoers. There is a time for that, okay? So if someone were to do something very awful, if there was some type of abuse, you know, some type of sexual abuse in the church, hey, I would report that to the authorities, okay? This is not the Catholic church where we sweep it under the rug. It's not like pedophilia takes place and you just move that priest to another church so nobody knows about it, no. Things like that need to be taken to the proper authorities. But when you read the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you'll see these are about minor matters, trivial matters that people in church should just be working out between themselves. Okay? And Paul is criticizing them for taking it to the authorities. Why are you going to, going to the authorities? And then he explains that these authorities that you go to, and he gives a list of the, the type of people you go to, he says in verse number 10, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And you can read it in your own time, but he says, look, if you go to these judges, if you go to the, to the government for trivial matters, you're going to the unbelieving world and they're full of these sins. They're extortioners. You're going to them for these little matters? That's not the right place for those kinds of things. Okay? So if, if you upset me, if we get into a bit of a quarrel about something, you know, that isn't criminal, you know, we shouldn't be running to the authorities and trying to sue one another. We should be trying to figure that out between brothers and sisters in the Lord. Okay? But of course, when it comes to major criminal offenses, hey, those things should be reported to the authority. But I want to show you that Paul is saying, look, don't fellowship with people in your church that are extortioners. But at the same time, you need to understand that our government, our governing authorities are full of people that are full of extortioners. And this is why we say, you know, it, you know I'll say things like, our government is corrupt. And yet, you know what? Our Australian government is not as corrupt as some of the South American uh, governments. You know, like Southeast Asian governments, they're very corrupt. I mean, you basically live your life knowing that you've got to bribe your way through life. I mean, that's, that's how corrupt some of those places are. And Paul is just reminding us, look, even judges, even authorities are full of, you know, dr uh, full of drunkards, covetous people, revilers, and extortioners. All right, so that's, that's the reference there of, of being an extortioner. Now, I looked up in the dictionary, what does it mean to be an extortioner? Or what does extortion mean? And this is what it means. It means to obtain, that's like money or information, etc., from a person by violence, intimidation, or abuse of authority. Obtained by force, torture, threats, or the like. Now, the term that we would most often use is blackmail. Okay, extortion and blackmail are, are two terms that can be used, uh, you know, ex ex you can exchange between those two terms, you know, blackmail. And if you've ever been blackmailed before, you know, and basically this is what it looks like. Someone's got, someone has something about you, someone knows something about you, maybe some information, or maybe they're threatening you, and they say, look, if you go and do this, or if you go and do that, I'm going to let people know about X, Y, and Z. Okay. Now, sometimes I have seen this even in children. All right. Let me give you an idea. Let me give you a picture of this. And maybe you're familiar with this. Maybe in your childhood, maybe you've seen this with your own children. Especially when you've got a household full of children, right? Where one child does something wrong, and he doesn't want mum and dad to know about it because he's going to get in trouble, right? But one of the siblings knows about it, and he says, "Look, if you don't go and do my chores today, if you don't make my bed, if you don't do the things that you know, then I'm going to tell mum and dad what you did." All right, that's blackmail. That's actually extortion. Yeah, at, at a minor level, at a very insignificant level, right? But this is something we need to get out of our children because children learn this at a very early age. How can I take advantage of someone else, you know? And listen, as, as children, it's no big deal. But when these children don't learn the lessons, they're going to become adults. They're going to learn how to be extortioners. They're going to learn how to blackmail. And it's going to be much worse. The situation is going to be much, much worse in uh, adulthood. One story that I remember in one of my old churches, there was this missionary passing through. I can't remember his name right now, but he was uh, serving as a missionary in Papua New Guinea. 
okay? He was serving. And I, I remember, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with some of those uh, missionaries, but they would send letters. Every, let's say once a month, they would send a letter and they'll update the churches as to how they're doing it on the missions field, any salvations, any, anything like that, any, any needs they may have. And I remember a story where the missionary was going uh, through like the jungles of Papua New Guinea or whatever, trying to get through a tribe, and then him and his party were, were, were pu- pulled over uh, by this militia, by, by this local militia with weapons, okay? And basically this militia just pointed their weapons at them, you know, threatening to, for them to lose their life. Listen, they said, listen, you've got to pay us this much, okay, and we'll let you through. And if you don't pay us, we're going to kill you, okay? And I remember reading that, hearing about that in the letter, and then the missionary was like, we had no choice but to pay, you know, the money. And I remember at that time, I, I didn't fully understand this, the extortion, but I, I thought that was a bribe. I misunderstood. I, I was kind of angry at the missionary. I said, why did you pay a bribe? But that's, that's not, it's, it, that wasn't bribe. Those missionaries, now I understand it better. They were being threatened to lose their life, otherwise they'd have to, you know, uh, they'd have to cough up the money, otherwise they'd lose their lives, basically. That's, that's called extortion. That's not a bribe. A bribe is different, okay? So the extortion is being done by the person in authority or the one that holds power, Okay, but a bribe would be different. It'd be, it'd be the one that doesn't hold the power and you're giving money or you're giving some type of favor to somebody in order for you to, uh, you, know, you know, pass by a certain barrier or, or, or you know, uh, pass a test or, or pass something, right? That's where you would maybe bribe someone. That is sinful, but extortion is kind of the reverse. The person holding the power over you will not let you go through unless you pay up, unless you do something differently. Now, another story that I remember about this is... Um, you know, I grew up, you know, not far from here. I grew up in Canley Vale, which is close to Cabramatta. And if you guys know about Cabramatta in the 80s uh, and maybe 70s, 80s and early 90s, it was a really, it was an area full of crime. It was, it was uh, full of gangs, full of, uh, you know, uh, drug, drugs and, and things like this, okay? And, you know, there was a large immigrant that was coming through Cabramatta uh, that were from Vietnam, okay? And so there was a lot of, lot of Vietnamese uh, gangs. And, and I remember the, hearing these stories where if you had a shop in Cabramatta, okay, that you would be visited by these gangs, okay, and these gangs would say, listen, we're going to protect your shop. Okay? We're going to look after your shop. We're going to look after you. We're going to make sure nothing bad happens to you as long as you pay us X amount of dollars every month. Okay? Now, look, they had no interest to look after the shop. What they meant by that is, if you don't pay us this every month, we're going to come and ransack your shop, we're going to burn it down, we're going to hurt you, we're going to hurt your family. That's what they meant. Hey, that's extortion. That's extortion, right? Hey, we're threatening you to destroy your business unless you pay us up, unless you look after us. That's extortion, okay? And this is a sin that we cannot allow in our church. We cannot allow one brother to be an extortioner to another brother in this church. If someone is operating that way, making you feel pressured or, or you know, uh, difficulty because you're afraid of what that person may do unto you, if you don't give them what they want, that person must be kicked out of the church. Okay? This is very dangerous. Okay? I think this is one of the most dangerous sins on this list, actually, okay? because you're actually really hurting another brother in the Lord. All right, so now please go to Psalm 109. Go to Psalm 109, because just as a reminder, we're going to all the references that speak on extortion, okay? Psalm 109. Now, some people have a... Some people struggle with Psalm 109 and other psalms of the like, because this is a psalm... Now, a lot of the psalms are beautiful prayers, beautiful songs... From, you know, from, from the psalmist to the Lord, asking for help, asking for guidance, asking for deliverance. But you know there are some psalms that the psalmist is basically praying that God will destroy his enemies. Okay, these are called imprecatory psalms okay, or imprecatory prayers. And a lot of people, a lot of churches don't like to teach on these things because they think, well, I don't want to teach something negative. I don't want to teach something where you're praying against an enemy because we're trying to get everybody to love one another. Okay, and the truth of the Bible is yes, you know, as the default option, we should be striving to love and we are commanded to love our enemies. But you know, there is a time when we can pray for the destruction of our enemies. Okay, look at Psalm 109 and verse number one. Now, I don't know if all your Bibles say this, but at the beginning it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David. Have you got that? A psalm of David. 
Now, the Bible tells me that David was a man after God's own heart. Okay? So don't tell me that this psalm is David's opinion, or David should not have prayed this, David should not have said these words. No, this is David after God's own heart. I don't know if God can say that about you, or me, okay? But David is a man after God's own heart, and he was moved by the Holy Ghost to write this psalm, okay? So let's read it. Verse number one, Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me, they have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. So you can see how he's going to the Lord because he's got certain enemies that are against him here. Okay. Now drop down to verse number 8. Drop down to verse number 8. It says, Let his, that's the enemies, let his days be few and let another take his office. Now before we keep reading the rest of the psalm, what is verse number 8 about? Does anybody know? Raise of hand if you know what verse number 8 is. Yes, Rams? Yeah, exactly. So in Acts chapter 1, when the 12 disciples, well, the 11 disciples chose to replace Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus, who was not a believer, they referred to this psalm. Okay, verse number 8 there, let another take his office. And of course, Matthias was the one that took the, the position that Judas Iscariot wanted. Anyway, that's a trivial thing. But I want to show you that this psalm is applicable to someone like a Judas Iscariot. Okay, someone extremely wicked, right? And now drop down to verse number 11. Look what it says here. Speaking about the wicked, it says, Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the strangers spoil his labor. So what is that saying? King David is saying, look, there's this wicked enemy against me, Lord. He's making my life difficult. I need your help. Can you send an extortioner to take everything that he owns? That's what he's saying. Say, so can you send, can you make his way difficult? Can you make his way challenging? Can you send some wicked people his way so he has his own enemies instead of being an enemy toward me? And he specifically prays and asks for an extortioner to come and catch all that he hath. Let the strangers spoil his labor. He says, Lord, make him unproductive. Please bring other wicked men into his life to destroy him. Bring the extortioner to destroy the wicked. Okay. So look, is, is extortion a positive thing in the Bible? No, it's always negative, okay? It's even bad to wicked people. It's even a bad thing to, to bad people, okay? And so this is the thing about extortion. It, it, is, uh, it is bad for everybody. You know, uh, good people get, uh, you know, face extortion. Bad people sometimes go for extortion. And you know what? If you have an enemy, it is not wrong for you to pray such a prayer, someone that is trying to hurt you, someone that's trying to bring you down, to pray and ask God, God, can you deal with that person? Can you destroy them? You say, but Pastor Kevin, the Bible says, love your enemies. Absolutely. Please love your enemies and go to God and say, God, can you take care of my enemy? I'm going to love them. I'm going to be doing good unto them. Okay, but Lord, you need to, and look, vengeance belongs to the, to the Lord, the Bible says. Is mine, saith the Lord. Okay, so I'm going to do good to my enemies. I'm going to do good to those that, um, make, you know, make my life difficult, but I'm counting on God to one day send the extortioner. One day for God to send somebody in that person's path to bring them down. Okay, so that's the balance. That's the balance. We do good to our enemies and we allow God to bring justice, okay, to bring judgment upon the wicked. Let's keep going in, in verse number 5, because look at verse number 5. Now remember, he's asking, in the same psalm, 109 verse number 5, so he's asking God to take care of this enemy, right? But look at verse number 5. It says, And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. So how has David treated his enemy? He's shown him love. He's, he's been good toward his enemies, yeah? So you can see that within the same psalm, the same psalm that he's asking God, take down my enemies, destroy my enemies. He says, look, but I'm going to show him love and I'm going to do good, to him, good unto him. Okay? So you can see that, that in the Bible, it's consistent. We do good and allow God to take care of vengeance on our behalf. Now, if you can please, uh, uh, let's see, go to Ezekiel 22. Go to Ezekiel chapter 22. So my first point was extortion is so bad that it is a curse for the wicked. Okay, extortion is a curse even for the wicked. Okay, the next point that I have on extortion is that extortion will cause you to forget the Lord. 
Okay? If you're someone that is extorting others, you're going to find yourself forgetting the Lord. Okay? Ezekiel 22 and verse number 12. Ezekiel 22 and verse number 12. And the context of what we're about to read is about Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem had become so wicked in the eyes of God. And it says here, and, and by the way, extortion is one of the list of sins that was happening in Jerusalem. Okay, look at verse number 12. It says, In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase. And thou hast greedily gained off thy neighbors by extortion. And has forgotten me, saith the Lord God. So look, Israel or, or Jerusalem had become so wicked, the people were, were not being neighborly toward one another. They were greedy. They wanted more and more that they would gain things off their neighbors by extortion. Okay? And by doing this, they had forgotten the Lord. Okay? So I want you to think about this. We're talking about sins that will get you kicked out of church. If someone in our church is an extortioner, do you think they're going to be in church because they, they, they come in to sing praises to the Lord? Do they have a love for God or is it that they're trying to gain from their neighbor? They're trying to gain from their neighbor. They're not coming to church to love the Lord because the Bible tells us here that the extortioner has forgotten the Lord. Okay? This is why we kick that person out of the church because they're not here to bless us. They're not here to worship God. They come to our church to take advantage of people. Okay? Take advantage. And listen, the, the, problem, the problem with the church... Or the problem it's not really a problem it's a good thing people think that the church is made up made up of nice people made up of good people and sometimes you may fall into the trap of just trusting everybody in church hey because we're all brothers and sisters in the lord yeah we're all brothers and sisters but you know we still have the flesh we still have the sin nature you know some of us had some some very wicked pasts all right and, and, and some some sins that you know are easy to be tempted toward and listen, we're all striving to be more like Jesus. We're all striving to live more righteously. And thank God salvation is not based on our works. Otherwise, none of us would go to heaven. Okay? Okay? But you can't just have this, igno you know, this uh, yeah, ignorant mind and think, I can just trust everybody in the church. You can't. Okay? You can't trust everybody in the church. We all have a sin nature. There might be people in our congregation that wants to take advantage of you, that wants to extort you. Okay, so you got to have a level of protection. And again, people come into churches because they know that's where I can take advantage of people. Why do you think there are so many wicked church leaders, so many wicked religious leaders? Why are there so many pedophiles in the Catholic Church? Because they think, well, if I go to church and I have a position, then I can take advantage of this and that. That's why there's so many wicked people. You know, churches bring the best people, but it also brings the worst of people as well. Okay, that's just the truth of the of the of the of church. You know, Jesus gave a parable that says we are sown amongst the wheat, and that's just the way it's going to be, guys. You know, we can't. You know, Judas Iscariot, the perfect example. Judas Iscariot. They all thought he was a great guy. You know, even when Jesus basically tells the disciples, "It's Judas that's going to betray me," they're like, "No, like, must be, it could be, it's probably be me." <laughs> Jesus tells them black and white, "It's going to be Judas." They're like, it "Can't be." You know, you know, Jesus tells Judas, go, go and do what you're going to do. Go and betray me. They're like, oh yeah, Judas must be going to buy something. They couldn't believe it, you know, when it's someone in the church that had done so wickedly. All right. So the next point that I have here, brethren, is that, oh, by the way, uh, full of extortion. And, you know, this is why, because I was talking about the church leaders, right? And things like that. And if we, actually, you don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you once again. So from the reading that we had before, Matthew 23, verse 25 Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees? Now, if you remember the scribes, they're the people that would write down the laws. Okay, that's why they're called scribes. They would copy the law of Moses. They would copy the scriptures. These are people that knew their Bibles really well because they're writing them out again and again. The Pharisees, it was a sect of religious leaders. Okay? They weren't, many of them were not saved. Some did. I, I believe Nicodemus got saved, for example. Another Pharisee that got saved was Paul. Okay, if you remember Paul the Apostle, he was a Pharisee before he uh, became the apostle but jesus says to the scribes and pharisees woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter but within they are full of extortion and excess okay so the next point that i have about extortioners is that extortioners have an appearance of good extortioners have an appearance of good what did god say about the scribes and pharisees that they're clean on the outside okay on the outside of the cup of the platter they look like religious leaders 
they wore the long robes. All right, they 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 had all the religious paraphernalia, or whatever you know, on, on their on their clothing. Okay, they looked high and mighty. They looked righteous. They were you know, people look at them and go, wow, look at that Pharisee walk by there. Right. So on the outside they looked righteous. They, on the outside they looked great. They looked grand. But Jesus says, no, you're full of extortion. And this is why you have to be careful about the church you attend. You have to be careful about the leaders that you put yourself under. You know, you need to make sure that that guy is not full of extortion. That guy is not trying to blackmail you. He's not trying to take advantage of you, right? Because people, again, they tend to trust their religious leaders. And you say, Pastor Kevin, you're the religious leader here. Yeah, you know, be careful, okay? You may not always find, you know, you may not always be a, a part of Blessed Hope Baptist Church. You might find yourself in some other church. And yes, there are extortioners, there are vile predators even amongst independent Baptist churches. You've got to be careful, okay? And look, Jesus is giving us a lesson here that religious leaders can look great on the outside, but on the, on the inside, they can be full of extortion. You've got to be careful. And this is why you know, one of the qualifications of being a pastor, of being, you know, a, a bishop, is not greedy for filthy lucre. That's so important because it's so easy for somebody, you know, to become greedy of money. And then before you know it, they're trying to exhort as much from the church as they can financially. Okay? And you say, you greedy of filthy lucre, Pastor Kevin? I don't think so. All right. I mean, I was earning like four times, five times as much as I was than being a pastor. All right. I did not become a pastor to make money. I guarantee you that. Okay. So I, I know that's definitely not the case. But then Jesus says this in verse number 26. He says, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, and the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead man's bones and full of, sorry, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Okay? And so listen, there are religious leaders that will take advantage of your situation. They will. And look, think about, and I've already mentioned the Catholic Church, but think about the Catholic priests. And think about the, you know, the confession. You know how church members have to go to their Catholic priest, I don't know, in a booth or whatever, and confess their sins? Now listen, I'm never going to confess my sins to you guys. And I will never ask you to confess your sins to me. Okay? There's only one person that you confess your sins to, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You take it to God. You ask Him to forgive you of your sins. All right? I'm not interested in knowing your sins. I'm not interested in knowing your dirty laundry. Okay? Why do you think, though, there are some pastors or some religious leaders, like or priests or whatever, in different churches, that want to know your dirty laundry? Why do you think that? I'll tell you why. Because they're going to become extortioners. They're going to take that information that they know about you and hold you hostage. I mean, think about it. Think about it. You know, the, these Catholic priests, right? They're hearing all the, all the sins of their members. They're hearing all the dirty secrets, all their secret sins that they have. I mean, think about how much power they've got to know all this information about the members in the church. Okay? And before you know it, what do you have? They've got access to little children. You know, they commit all kinds of wicked acts. You know, according to their religion, they're not even allowed to get married. So they express it in very vile and filthy ways. You know, just, just the evil that we see in some churches, you know, the evil that we see in some religions is because that Pharisee, that scribe, is an extortioner. They're filthy on the inside. And Jesus gave the commandment, hey, get the inside clean first. Clean the inside. Get saved. You know, uh, wash yourself with the word of God. You know, live after the commandments of God. Be more righteous. And then the outside, you know, will automatically go clean. You know, they're trying to clean the outside. They don't care about the inside. And so, if you can now turn to, uh, go to Luke 18. Go to Luke chapter 18. Luke 18, verse 11. Luke 18 and verse 11. Now, you may be familiar with this story. This is the story that Jesus Christ speaks about a Pharisee and a publican that go to the temple to pray unto God. Okay? Now, remember, what did God say about the Pharisees? That they're full of extortion. Right? 
And then Jesus gives this story about the Pharisee. Look at verse number 11. So the Pharisee is praying, right? It says in verse number 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee. Let's stop there for a minute. Now it says here, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now listen, when you pray, you're praying to God, aren't you not? Okay, we're, we're, we're invoking God, we're asking God for help. We're speaking to God. Well, this Pharisee, according to Jesus, is praying thus with himself. He's only really praying to himself. And then when he says, God, he's speaking to himself. Okay? Because this man is full of righteousness. He says, God, I thank thee, look at this, that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He says, thank you, God, that I'm not an extortioner. What did Jesus just finish saying? You guys are full of extortion. <laughs> and that's what it is about extortion, brethren. Is that, you know, extortioners don't even know how bad they are. They don't even know how wicked they are. They don't even acknowledge how bad it is because these guys are full of it. And they're saying, thank God I'm not an extortioner. Okay? So, you know, why, why did Jesus call them hypocrites? Now you know why. Okay? Because they, 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 they're, they're referring to themselves as righteous and yet they're full of extortion. And so, you know... I, the thing about extortioners that, that I, I, I think is the situation, because they want to take advantage of other people, and because they've got this messed up mindset, it's like they think that other people, because it says, thank God I'm not like an extortioner like this publican. Okay, thank God I'm not like these other people. They think that others are extortioners. They think that others are trying to do them harm. They think others are going to try to take advantage of them. So in their mindset, it's like, well, I better take advantage of them first. I better do what I can. I better have a power and authority of that person before they have power and authority over me, before they try to exhort me, okay? Because that's how wicked they are. They think because I'm like this, everybody else is like this. That's not the case, okay? Now, please go to the book of Daniel. Go to Daniel chapter 3. Go to Daniel chapter 3. Extortion. So, you know, even though when I, I gave you the story about that missionary in, in Papua New Guinea, and I kind of got angry at him, like a little bit within myself, I said, why did you pay that money? Right? And because I was thinking of it as a, a bribe, but now I understand it was extortion, right? So I got thinking about this a little bit, and I was thinking, you know, what would be the things that I'm willing to sell? What are the things that I'm willing to give up? You know, if I find myself in a position that I'm being extor uh, ex ex extorted, what am I willing to give up? You know, what if, and this happens, you know, this happens in the world where, you know, a child might be kidnapped, okay, and then the parents are asked a ramson, ramson, ramson you know, ramson, <laughs> you know, pay this much, pay, you know, a million dollars and we'll give you back your child, or whatever, you know, there are situations like that, you know, what would you be willing to give up, you know? And, you know, I kind of thought about, let's say one of my ch child, you know, children got kidnapped, my wife or something, you know, I'd be willing to just give it all up. I don't care. I'd be willing to give them all the money I have. I'm willing to give them all the possessions I hold. You know, I'd, I'd be willing to give it all up for, for the life of my loved one, okay? I mean, I was just thinking about the situation, right? What would I be willing to give? I'd give it all up. I don't care. These are material things, you know? Um, you can get those material things back one day. You know, you can't necessarily get back a life if it gets taken away, things like that. But then, you know, I got thinking, well, what if the situation was you know, we'll give you back your child, but you'd have to renounce God. You'd have to say that you hate God, you know, that you don't believe on Jesus Christ anymore or, or something like this. Or someone points a gun at my head and says, hey, you know, give up Christianity, give up your faith and, we'll, you know, uh, you can save your life. Would you be willing to do that? And honestly, I would not. I would not. Okay. Now, the worst extortion that you can possibly face is the extortion of worship. The extortion of of worship and when we look at Daniel chapter 3 we have a situation where uh, you know Shadrach Meshach and Abednego are being exhort, ex extorted for worship okay now these are these are Jews that have been taken into captivity by the Babylonians all right let's pick up the story there in verse number one Daniel chapter 3 in verse number one it says Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits, he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together together the princes and the governors and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then and Herod cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at which time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And so what we see here is the extortion of worship. It says, look, you come and worship this image, you come and worship this idol, okay, and if you don't do it, when you hear the music play, if you don't bow down and worship it, hey, then we're going to cast you into a burning, fiery furnace. Hey, isn't that blackmail? Absolutely. You lose your life if you don't worship this image. All right? Now let's drop down to verse number 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto, sorry, and I'll give you the context there. Of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they worshipped the true God of the Bible. They worshipped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they were not going to bow down and worship this idol. Okay? And this became known by the king, that they would not bow down to the idol that was uh, made after his image. Nebuchadnezzar spake, in verse number 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that ye uh, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, and at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and this dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So he says, look, the king gives them one more chance. Listen, if you hear the music, I'm going to give you one more chance. If you bow down, you do well. Okay? And you'll be doing what I've asked you to do. Hey, but if you don't worship this image, then we're going to... Hey, who's going to deliver you out of my hands? He says, look, I'm, I'm going to kill, kill you, right? And I love how they respond here. I love how they respond to King Nebuchadnezzar because they don't sugarcoat the response. They're very blunt in their response to the king here. And they say in verse number 17, oh, sorry, verse number 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Okay? He says, look, we're not worried how we're going to answer this. We're going to be blunt with how we respond to you. Okay? We're not being careful. We're going to tell you the honest truth. Verse number 17, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. So King Nebuchadnezzar said, who's going to deliver you out of my hand? Well, they said, our God. The God that we worship will deliver us out of your hand. He's the one that is able to do this. All right. So they stand up to the king. They don't give in to this extortion of their own lives. They said, no, we're not going to bow down and worship your idol. We're going to only worship our Lord God. Look at verse number 18. But if not, so if, if God doesn't deliver us, okay, if God doesn't save us out of your hand, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. He says, look, we're expecting God to save us. It's God that will deliver us out of your hands. But if God decides not to deliver us out of your hands, hey, we're still not going to worship your image. We're still not going to worship those false gods, right? We'd rather die than worship a false god. All right? So they were willing to lose their lives in light of this situation. Look at verse number 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into a burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, 
and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So you think that'd be the end of them, right? Verse number 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the guys that uh, have taken and arrested them, the guys that have thrown them into the fiery furnace, actually lose their lives. It's, it's that hot that they themselves lose their, lose their lives, the ones that are sh- uh, throwing these three Hebrew men into the furnace. And then it says in verse number... Uh, 23 and these three men shadrach meshach and abednego fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace then nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said with his counselors did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire they answered and said unto the king true o king he answered and said lo i see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurts and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. It's an amazing story. Amazing story that these three Jewish men stood up to King Nebuchadnezzar at the potential loss of their lives. Hey, they were not willing to worship a false god. They were not willing to reject the God of the Bible. Okay? They stood up and they, they said, look, God will deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down and worship your false gods. They're thrown into the fiery furnace. And instead of there being three in the furnace... King Nebuchadnezzar looks in, he sees a fourth. And of course, he recognizes him as the son of God there, right? The son of God. Listen, was there a son of God before Bethlehem's manger? Amen, that's what we see right there, okay? Listen, we believe and teach on the eternal sonship of God. Jesus Christ as the eternal son of God. He did not, he did not become the son of God at Bethlehem's manger. He did not become the son of God at a specific time. Jesus Christ has always been the son of God. Okay. Now that's for another topic, but I'm just trying to show you here that it's very clear that Jesus Christ as the son of God was operating even in the Old Testament days. And he was there helping and delivering these three saved men Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, from losing their lives in the furnace. Now look at verse number 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. So obviously a miracle takes place. They come out of the fire, they're not even burnt. They're not even hurt. They don't lose their lives all right so you know this is an area that we as christians we need to get the courage of shadrach meshach and abednego if someone you know is extorting me for my wealth for my possession not that i have much go for it you know what at the end of the day i don't care god is just god will you know will bring vengeance upon that god will look after his children but listen when it comes to our worship to god do not you know be be someone that is not willing to give that up be someone that is not willing to extort, you know, allow you to, yourself to be extorted to worship some false god, okay, even at the loss of your life. You say, that sounds pretty extreme. It is extreme, you know. You would need to be someone who has great faith to be able to stand up to that. Now, listen, it wasn't just these three Hebrew boys that were, that were the only Jews there. No, all of Judah was taken into captivity, you know, that was spread out throughout the kingdom. You think there was only three Jewish boys in this place? There were other Jews you know, there are other, even some believers that definitely, I mean, these are the only three that stood up. There were others that would have bowed down to the image. You know, they said, look, I'm not willing to lose my life. I'm just going to bow down uh, to this image, you know, even if it's not just a heart worship, but it's just something in my body that I'm going to do just so I can not lose my life. You, these are not the only three. They took an entire nation into captivity. So there were other people there and there were other Jews willing to, you know, bow down to the false gods. You know, but we need to learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We need to be people like this. And look, Jesus Christ may very well step in and deliver you out of the hand of the enemy. Okay, that is a, a real possibility that we see in the Word of God. Now, if you can please go to Luke 19. Go to Luke 19. Extortion. It's a wicked sin. Okay, it's a wicked sin. Now, maybe. You've extorted somebody in the past, okay? Maybe, you know, I'm not talking about someone in this church, and I hope you've not done it to someone in this church, okay? 
But even if you have done it to somebody in this church, you know, or if you've done it in the past, let me encourage you, brethren. Now, listen, if you've done it in the past, that has no reflection on you in church today. I'm not going to kick you out of church because you did it in the past. I'm talking about here in the, within the members, since we started this church, if you are someone that is an extortioner, then that is someone that gets kicked out of the church, okay? But listen, if you've done this in the past, okay, and I'm sure you've done some wicked things in your life, okay, I don't know if you've been an extortioner or not, but if you have, you need to deal with it immediately. You need to go and fix that. You need to go and fix that, okay? Now, the story that we get in Luke 19 is the story of Zacchaeus, who was like a tax collector, okay? Look at verse number 1, Luke 19 and verse number 1. It says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Okay? So the publican, tax collector was known as a publican. Publican is someone that works for the, for the government, basically. Okay? So you're a public, uh, what do you call them? Public servant, yeah. So publican is like the same thing, a public servant. And he was rich. How did he get rich, though? Verse number three. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. So he's quite a short guy, and he couldn't see Jesus over the crowds of the people. Verse number four. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Now look, if Zacchaeus wasn't saved yet, I believe this is the point that he got saved. Because he received Jesus joyfully into his house. And the Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Okay. Now look at verse number 7. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Okay, so Jesus starts to receive a lot of criticism for going and spending time with Zacchaeus. All right, because everybody knows he's a sinner. Okay, he didn't get rich being honest and, and doing a hard, you know, uh, a normal day's work as, as a tax collector. He got rich because he stole money from others. Okay, and uh, look at verse number eight. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now look, he's saying, I have actually taken more than I need, okay, yeah, you know, and I may have even taken by false accusation. I may have... And when he says this, he did. All right? He's made false accusations toward people and they've paid up, paid up more taxes than they should have. Okay? So what's, that's extortion. Okay? He says, look, if you don't pay up, I'm going to make these false accusations against you. Or I've made these false accusations, so you pay up. Okay? Because that person doesn't want to be thrown in jail. That person doesn't want to you know, lose whatever they have. So they'll pay up and they're victims of extortion. And so Jesus goes and spends time with Zacchaeus, a man who in the past has extorted others. That's why people knew he was a sinner. That's why people did not like Zacchaeus, right? But notice what he says. He says, if I've done that by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. He says, look, if I've taken from somebody a thousand dollars, I'm going to give him back four thousand dollars. Okay? He, he spent time with Jesus. He realizes his sins. And he says, look, I've done wrong. I need to go back and fix that. Now, that's something he's done in the past. That's something he's done before he received Jesus into his house. But now that he has received Jesus into his house, now that he is a believer, now he says, look, I need to make these things right. And brethren, if you've committed extortion, you go and make those things right. You know, if you've taken something from another person that does not belong to you, you go and restore to that person fourfold. Okay? You go and do that. And listen, the reason Zacchaeus says fourfold, four times as much, is because that was a law in the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, you don't need to turn there, Exodus 22 verse 1, it says, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. All right? So if you stole somebody's ox, you know, which was a, a, an animal of labor, you'd have to restore five times as many. And if you stole a sheep, which you know, does not do the same level of labor as an ox, 
then if you stole that, you restore and go give back four. You know, if, if you've ever got something stolen from your house, I don't know, have you ever had your car? I remember my dad got his car stolen once, all right? So the thief, according to the law of God, would have had to give my dad back four cars, right? I mean, living under the Old Testament laws would have been amazing. I would have been like, yeah, go ahead, steal whatever you want. I mean, you wouldn't be, a, you, you wouldn't be saying, I've got to lock up my bike. I've got to lock up all, you know, I've got to keep everything inside, guys, in case someone steals. You just leave things out in the open. You don't mind if someone steals because you're going to get four times or five times as much. All right? So, you know, Zacchaeus, he, he knew the law of Moses. And he says, look, I'm going to go back and restore fourfold. Okay? Now, I wish we had those laws today. You know? But anyway, you know, the laws of God are, are, are good and right. Look at verse number nine. And Jesus answered, uh, said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay? So listen, if you've committed extortion in your past, I'm not going to kick you out of the church because you've done it in the past, but what I would really encourage you to do is go and fix it now. Go and say, man, I've done wrong to so-and-so. I don't care who it is. Go and fix it. Go and make things right. I'll tell you why. Because these things have a way of coming back and biting you. They have a way, you know, things in the past that you've done wrong to somebody have a way, some, it's, most likely it's going to pop up its head in the future and, and make your life a hell. You better go and, and restore that as soon as you have the opportunity. You know, uh, back in the, in the days when, you know, now everything's live, now everything's streaming, right? Back in the days when I was like a, a teen, I, I borrowed a few videos from the video. You know when you go to a video store? You don't get the VHS tape, remember that? You have to have like a library card, like a card, right? <laughs> anyway, I, I, had, I had borrowed some, uh, some whatever, some movies or whatever, and I returned them late. I think it was like, it was it Video Easy. Yeah, Video Easy, that's what it was. Video Easy in Canley Heights, all right? And I, I had returned some, some of them very late. And so I had late fees. Remember the late fees? You get late fees if you didn't return them on time. Well, anyway, I, I never went back and paid them. In fact, I said, oh, man, I don't want to pay them. So I never went back to the, to the store, right? As, I was like a teenager. And then, like, several years later, I kind of read this story about Zacchaeus. And I thought, oh, man, you know, I better go and restore fourfold. <laughs> so I remember just driving to the, to the video easy, and it had shut down, though. You know, it wasn't there anymore. But, I, you know, to this day, I feel really bad. Like, I have no idea. How can I go and fix that now, right? But, you know, I, I tried to make an effort, right? I tried to make an effort. What I'm trying to say to you, brethren, is if you've committed extortion... You know, if, if you've committed theft or, or something like this, or you go and you, you owe and you, you know, you, need, you, you better go back and fix those things. You know, that's what God expects from you. You know, when Zacchaeus does this, Jesus is rejoicing, rejoicing in this man's salvation. Hey, look, look at the effectiveness of Zacchaeus' salvation to the point that he's willing to go and fix all these past mistakes that he's done in the past. You know, praise God for Zacchaeus. Praise God for that story. I think it's, I think it's a great story there. All right, now... Please go to Isaiah 16, Isaiah 16, and we're near the end now. Isaiah 16, we're going to uh, one of the final references here on extortion. Isaiah 16. Extortion is a criminal offense. Okay, extortion is a criminal offense. And I looked this up, you know, in the law of our land, Australian law, extortion is also a criminal offense. Okay, if you blackmail somebody, you take something from somebody else, you know, by threats, by violence, these kinds of things. This is a criminal offense, not just in the law of our land, but it's also a criminal offense in the Bible. Okay, Isaiah 16, verse number 4. The Bible says, Let mine outcasts dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a, uh, a covet uh, to them for the face of the spoiler. Now look at this. For the extortioner is at an end, the spoiler ceaseth, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. Now, it's talking about these extortioners, they're at an end. What is, what is this end that is being spoken about in this chapter? Look at verse number five. And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth, in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment, and hasting righteousness. So when you look at verse number five, and you see that the throne shall be established, right? And he shall sit upon it in truth. Who's this he? What's his throne? What period of time are we talking about here? 
Well, this is talking about Jesus Christ and his millennial kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes back and rules and reigns on this earth, and you know what's going to happen when he rules and reigns? Well, what do we see in verse number four? It says the extortioner is at an end. So when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to put an end to extortion. Yes, the extortion that goes on in government authorities, because he will be the government. The government will be upon his shoulders, the Bible says, right? But also the extortion on the land, okay? So from, from, from uh, Christ's reign in the millennium, he sees extortion as a crime. He sees it as a major sin. And he says, we're going to put an end to, ex to extortion, okay? So listen, in the kingdom of, of Jesus, it's a crime and it needs to be put at an end. In our nation, extortion is a crime, okay? What are you saying? I'm saying this, and, and, and maybe you haven't fully understood how wicked this sin is, you know? And if you're someone that is blackmailing somebody in this church, you're taking from that person whatever it is from that person because they're, they, feel they're, they, they feel threatened by you, okay? Not only will you be kicked out of the church, but it's a crime, and I will re report that crime. If I know about it, I will report that crime to the authorities. Okay? Just like I will report any kind of major crime that happens in this church, this is, we're not going to cover things up here. If something serious happens, like extortion, then not only will you be kicked out, but that crime will be reported to the government. Okay? To the, to the governing authorities over that. Okay? So, remember, this is a sin that will get you kicked out of church. Okay? There are a lot of sins that we commit. We commit sins every day. You know, either in our body, in our hearts, in our minds, in our imaginations. We're committing sin all the time, brethren, because none of us are perfect, okay? But there are some sins that are just so wicked, okay? Sins that may be even natural for you to think about doing, and yet in God's eyes, these are not just sins, but these are crimes, okay? And it's worthy to kick somebody out of the church about that, and also to be reported to the authorities about these things, okay? So, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a, 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 a beautiful sermon to, to preach about extortion. You know, it, you're, you're dealing with very wicked things, you know, in, in the Bible here. But, once again, if you have committed these things, please be like Zacchaeus. Please say, you know what, I'm going to go and restore that fourfold. You know what, I did bad to that guy back then, two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Man, I blackmailed that person. I need to go and restore that. I need to go and fix that, you know. Uh, please do. I, I truly encourage you as your pastor uh, to do that. All right, let's pray.